What's going on everybody, horror fans around the world? Welcome to this very special episode of Slash and Cast. Today we have the lovely Adrian King joining us. And if you don't know who Adrian King is, once again, you're not a real horror fan, you shouldn't be here. But <laughs> she is the lead actress in Friday the 13th, of course. Now she owns, you know, she's running Crystal Lake Winery, which is awesome, by the way. That's another thing you should check out. But uh, Adrian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It, it really does mean a lot. I mean, we're all really big fans of you. So having you on the show alone is, is an absolute pleasure. Well, I met you guys, and you are people that I need to have in my world. So <laughs> I'm happy to be talking to you, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Um, I'll, I'll open up, of course, on Friday the 13th. Um, actually, I'm going to go jump right into your your poster scheme now. You have been selling these posters, um, these limited edition posters across conventions. Um, I think you only had like 1,300 made. And it has a very unique story to it about this paper that you had from the notes that Sean, um, Sean Cunningham was taking. Can you actually like tell that story for us? Sure. It's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's awesome. It, so imagine, if you will, going back to uh, Labor Day 1979, that week was when we first started shooting, uh, after Boy Scouts left, we started shooting at Camp Novi Bosco in Blairstown, New Jersey, uh, a little movie, a little independent movie that was called by the 13th, but it kept on um, running out of money here and there, and we, as, it, as it went on, uh, I started collecting continuity Polaroids from the set and any other little pieces just in case we didn't finish Friday the 13th. It was just such an incredible experience. I wanted to make a collage or something from it, you know, from all the bits and pieces because I am an artist as well as an actress. So, um, obviously, the movie uh, finished and uh, I, it opened and it did pretty well, right? Yeah. Just- <laughs> Kind of. I did okay, I guess. <laughs> kind of. And so I totally forgot about all the stuff from Friday the 13th and all my boots and all my jewelry and everything was thrown into a box uh, with a script and everything was labeled Friday the 13th and I found it again uh, 25 years later when we moved to Southern Oregon. And uh, it's just the craziest thing because in the jeans pocket when I opened it up, were the original notes from the night that we shot the machete scene on the beach. I call it the ballet du machete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it was really choreographed, almost like a ballet, for it to have flowed so evenly and well. And uh, anyone who remembers the movie remembers that scene. It was quite the iconic one where Miss Betsy Palmer and I went for it uh, no holds barred, and uh, ended up just slicing her head off. It was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and those notes showed up in my jeans pocket in this box from the night we shot that. And not only were they coffee stained by you know Sean Cunningham's co- uh, coffee that evening, but they were two pieces of steno paper, and they were actually numbered, and they numbers were one through thirteen. Yeah. Total, what a coincidence. Total, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, it, it blew my mind. And so my first little uh, piece of art that came out of my studio once I moved to Oregon was a poster for me and a poster for Sean with these notes. And when he saw it, he was like, so, so taken aback. And of course, I did write ballet to machete on the top, and he thought that was hysterical, but he said, you know what? <laughs> Do the fans a favor. They'll love you forever. This is so unbelievable. Who would have ever thought that you would have seen the notes of that night? Um, <laughs> along with, you know, all the continuity Polaroids that you can see on my website if you want to take a look. Um, and my jewelry, all my jewelry, my boots, you know, I'll give them to the Smithsonian someday, like with Fonzie's jacket, you know. <laughs> um, he was just one way he said to make a, uh, a limited edition series. Call it Friday the 13th, not the ballet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and make it something special uh, so that uh, the fans can see it through my eyes. And that's what everyone's been doing with it is they write me back to say they freeze frame 1 through 13 and see it just a little bit differently as the director saw it that night through his eyes. And it 
in the notes, it mentions Betsy does this, and Tom Savini does this, and Topso does that, and, you know, Adrian does this. So it's pretty interesting to see that the cuts and the camera angles when you're actually watching it written down by the director. So, yeah, that is special. I'm glad you brought that up because there are a whole lot more of those. <laughs> Right. That, yeah, that's such a cool story. I, I remember meeting you in Texas for the first time and you telling that story. And that's I, I got the last one of that day. And I, I mean, I was like 1,251. So, I mean, that was probably yeah. between here in yeah. Texas or between here in Chicago, the last like chances I had to get it. I think Griffin, right. the rest of our crew, ended up getting like 1,280 something. So yeah. they're they're running out. Yeah, well, here's what, the, what you didn't what no one knows except I'll tell you now oh. is I saved, I saved zero through 100. Because I thought those those were so tiny numbers that um, I started with the one hundred, so I still have the zero, uh, the one through ninety nine. <laughs> well, so now we got to find you another convention once you run out of the thirteen hundred, and then get number one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure I'll be sent because people have been. They realize that they're almost out, so that I've been sending a lot of tubes of posters out recently. Oh. So it's, it's just the luck of the draw, totally the luck of the draw. Yeah, that, yeah, that's such a that's such a cool story, especially stuff that's really special, especially to collectors. I think that's something really great for all collectors. That's why I ended up getting one. That's why we have like six between the crew now. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because once they're done, they're done, and it it just makes it that much special. Right. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll go on to another question that I've, I've always wanted to ask you. Um, we jumped to Friday Thirteenth Part Two, and you you say goodbye pretty quick. Now, did you have did you have any say in that at all, really? Yeah, you know, I did have a little bit of a say, but ask me if anyone listened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, you know what? It was during that ugly time in my life where there was a stalker, and so I had a lot of people uh, trying to work things out uh, for me, and so uh, there was just too many, uh, what do they call it, too many cooks, <laughs> too many cooks trying to figure it all out at the same time. Yeah. But when um, when I met with uh, Steve and Denise, um, uh, we all kind of realized that whatever, and I'm totally still to this day, whatever they needed from me to get to part two, I was there because without them, I never, uh, you know, I would be still nobody. And because of them, I was somebody, even though I, at the point in time, I was kind of dealing with um, a little bit of, crappy stuff in my life. I still wanted to do what they needed in order to make it it flow. Uh, But uh, it was supposed to be left open-ended. It was supposed to be a horrible dream. Well, it was a horrible dream. It was a nightmare. It was supposed to be a nightmare within a nightmare, but um, it ended up being that, and I totally get it, you know, Jason became larger than life, and it's so much easier to have Jason than Alice doing killings, you know, who would buy that? I don't think, you know. I mean, I, I'm still a firm believer that Alice has severe PTSD to this day. I believe she still has nightmares about it. But she is alive because that whole first 10 minutes or whatever it was, uh, if you go through it, it, it's totally a nightmare. It doesn't make sense. Um, I don't know if any of you have friends who have gone through PTSD, but I have actually gone through it myself personally. Um, and uh, you can imagine things, and you could swear to God they are happening right there, and it's a dream within a dream. It's an ugly nightmare. So uh, whenever a fan comes up, and usually it's every other fan at a show I do, and says, I can't stand it that Alice was killed right off in the first, I always say, well... You can jump onto my campsite, and you know, because there's two thoughts, two camps of thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I, I believe Alice is drinking fine wine in the deep woods and painting somewhere. And uh, still, you know, she uh, she talks to Dr. Jenny every so often, and she keeps her on the, uh, the right path. And uh, you know, she's a happy camper. That's a really suffers. that's a really beautiful way to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> A happy camper who went through her her nonsense and survived early in life, you know, and and so now she's she's out there and and tries to help other survivors get through what they need to get through. Wow, 
that's that's such a cool way to look at things. Like you took it like a huge turn on that. <laughs> You know, originally it kind of was supposed to be something like that, and I thought it was going to work out really, really well, um, until, of course, uh, someone forgot to check that dang uh, ice pick, that retractable ice pick that didn't retract the first time. Oh, whoa, um, geez, really? <laughs> yeah, and, you, and, and that certainly would be considered a nightmare, right? Uh, yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Were you, what, were you, you know, on every level, number two was a nightmare within a nightmare. Oh, so, man. Uh, were you injured? Yeah. Like, from that situation? Well, it certainly didn't feel like a good thing. I... <laughs> you know, they had, to aim, they had to aim for the spot on my face, the little dent. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. Not the second time. But, yeah. um... But it was the last day of shooting, and everybody wanted to get home, and half the crew had already left, and so it was a skeleton crew. And, uh, we just did that entire scene in one night. Oh, wow. With no, and, and that entire first part of it was all ad lib because uh, I still don't have a script to part two. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I didn't have any pages of dialogue. Wow. It was like, okay, you're talking to your mom, go. Oh, yeah, so you just kind of showed up and went for it. It's very, oh, yeah. very I mean, run and gun. I, does it look like they did a wardrobe fitting? Oh, no. I guess I never really thought of that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, here, let's put this on. This uh, this should get, fit anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's... that's Including pregnant women, which I was not. I was thinner for the second one than I was for the first one. So, yeah, that's when I saw that, I went, oh, total nightmare. My least favorite color on the color wheel is Kelly Green. So, uh, yeah, nightmare within a nightmare. Man. <laughs> It sounds like you had a really good time on Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. <laughs> part one was uh, was the best. Part one was everything that could, you could have ever wanted from a film. <laughs> it was just so much fun, and everybody wanted just to finish this incredibly fabulous movie that we were all giving one hundred and twenty five percent to. And then in Part Two, when Paramount yeah. had it, it was just like you know, okay, let's just finish. Hurry up, let's go. Right. Yeah, independent films, you know, they take care of stuff like that. I think that's probably why independent film has been growing so much, because they really care about their work, and it's not just about well, making think, another dollar, you know? I, that's why my heart always goes out to the independent filmmaker first, if I can help them get to the next rung, and they've got a good script, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm there to help. Uh, because I love the passion that it takes to get something like this off the ground. And, of course, I appreciated being there when I was uh, 1979, but I sure appreciate it more because there's just anybody can make a film now, you know, with, mm-hmm. the, with the camera and everything. So it's even, I think, tougher, actually. Right. Tougher to get discovered, I guess. You know, there's so many people yeah. trying to make it now. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But... Independence have always been a tough one, and that's why it takes, you know, persistence, passion, and I, I say it's a three piece persistence, passion, and of course, patience. Yeah, that's true, very true. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of people that are in horror films usually don't like horror films. Like, people like Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, we, we did an interview with Kathleen Kinmont, and she wasn't the biggest fan of horror. She, well, she just gets scared very easily. Are you like that at all, or are you actually a fan of horror films? I like horror films. I really do. I like certain ones better. I mean, I love the 80s horror films, the slashers, that, because to me it's a real roller coaster ride. And I, I basically married into the business, too. My husband was George Romero's distributor, Richard Hafner, and ran the United Film Distribution. So when I met up with him in 86, you know, we both had... Uh, uh, we watched each other's movies, <laughs> you know. But uh, to be... Uh, honestly, during the 60s, I loved horror films. I used to go watch matinees with my brother and sister uh, on Long Island in Lindbrook, <laughs> if anybody out there is listening. Yeah. Uh, and they would have, like, double features back in the day, and we'd ride our bicycles and we'd watch them. And I loved, like, the Baby Janes and uh, the Frankensteins. But then, when The Exorcist came out, uh, and it could have something to do with the fact that I did go to Catholic school, I was scared to death. I don't know, because now I'll watch it and I laugh at it, like hysterically laugh at it. But where I, you know, I think Friday the 13th still packs that punch. 
to me, The Exorcist is more, more interesting as just watching it and, and trying to figure out why I was so scared. Mm. Um, it, you know, because when you watch it again now, it's just the special effects don't hold up. I don't think hold up as well as Savini's, personally. I don't know. But um, I didn't see any movies after Exorcist that were scary until uh, I saw Friday the 13th at a Captain Crew screening. So it did me in for a long time, but then I made up for it and kind of caught up. But I'm not a fan of, like, the songs or any of the uh, nasty... Uh, the torture uh, porn movies, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't like those. They don't do it for me. I like the just the scares, the real good scares. Right. Yeah. yeah the, what about you? We don't get uh, much legitimate suspenseful movies anymore. Uh, James Wan is about the only one really hanging yeah. in there still. Mm. At yeah, least there are... in the big, in the like Hollywood, in the big industries, independent filmmakers, there's some really talented ones out there. But James Wan is probably the only like big guy out there still making really good horror films. Right. Have you heard anything about the new one coming out? Has anyone heard anything about the new one? Because I'm just hoping it. Somebody gets it right. Are we? Are you referring to like the new Friday Thirteenth? Yeah. Um, okay. The new Friday the Thirteenth. Um, it originally was canceled. We had they had a, a remake or a sequel to the remake, and that was canceled. And now, um, Platinum Dunes is, is picking it back up, and it's kind of taking. There hasn't been much details on it, but it's taking a little bit of an origin story feel to it. Yeah, um, that was the last. Too, but they say that it was supposed to be coming out January seventeenth, but I haven't heard anything. There's no about way. it. There's no way. Um, I th- I'm pretty sure it's gonna get pushed back to October, um, probably to October thirteenth yeah. of twenty seventeen. But yeah, it's uh, it's kind of been up and down. The idea of an origin story. I don't. Do you like the idea of an origin story? I. How can you do it? I don't know. I don't know if you can really do that. Uh, because if Betsy Palmer is killing because, the, you know, the only reason she's killing is for, for Jason, the love of Jason, you know, what would she be killing for? Which, you know, would she be called killing bullies or something? Or would somebody, <laughs> uh, or would somebody else be a killer before she, I mean, would there be a killer pre Mrs. the Voorhees family, you know? I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know if the fans will buy into it, but right. you know. Yeah, I'm not uh, not too big into the idea either. No. Um, apparently, the idea is going to go into um, seeing what it was, how he was with his mother beforehand, and they're going to take the father into the story as well. So we'll see how that goes. I why are there murders? You know, then and what? You know, <laughs> who knows? I, maybe it's a, maybe it's the curse of the Voorhees family or something. I guess so. I I don't know it. I hope that it's a quick origin story, like something that, like we look at, like Spider Man, like a quick origin story, and then you just go right into, you know, the action. Like people, fans liked watching a slasher film, original like eighty slasher films, and seeing Jason kill people is why they came. You're rooting for the killer, except for the right. the first one, really. Um, right. So, so it's just I don't a know. Mystery, you don't know who the killer is. Right. That's why the first why? one works so well. Don't know why. Well, you don't know yeah. who, I mean, or why. Yeah, exactly. That's why I, I think the first one works so well, especially because you can. I mean, you're an actual legitimate, you know, heroine. People can actually root for you, and that's not like that in the other Friday films. So you, instead, you're just rooting for Jason. Right. You, you're almost hoping the, the campers get killed. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you like the remake to Friday Thirteenth? Is it still called the remake? <laughs> Well, I mean, just the, the 2009 reboot, I guess. Yeah, you know, I saw pieces of it, and I adore Derek Mears, but I didn't think that the movie did much for the franchise, personally. That's true. It kind of fell off. I, um, I'm not, like, the biggest I fan haven't... of it, but I think it stands out among remakes. Um, like, I'm not a big fan of Halloween remake, or, I mean, we get stuff... Like the House of Wax remake, stuff like that. I just think Friday the Thirteenth is Nightmare on Elm Street is another bad one. Friday the Thirteenth, I think, is better than those ones. But yeah, I just you know what remakes just for me never quite do it. I don't you know it's 
nobody has an original thought anymore. If you have to do a remake, and does it ever really live up to the original? That's you know, true. just think about the perfect storm that the original Friday the 13th had <laughs> with Manfredini and Savini and, you know, the director Sean Cunningham and the cast uh, with Betsy Palmer and Kevin Bacon and all the other talented individuals that were all thrown together. I mean, it, it, you can't recreate that. It was just kismet. Right. It's silly to try, though they may. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it's very true. Remakes are very, very hit or miss. There are some good ones out there. Actually, Savini has a great one with Night of the Living Dead. Yes. I think that's probably mm-hmm. the best remake of all time. Yeah, I should, yeah, and uh, I'm there with you on that. I thought that was very good myself. I did. I right. Did, I did. So, I mean, it, every once in a while we get lucky and there's a good one, but it, there sure hasn't really been a good one in a long time. That is true. That is I am. There's going to be a big Friday Thirteenth reunion next month. I will see Sean Cunningham, and I'm going to ask him if he has any <laughs> any little tidbit. So I hear if there's. If he should be privy to some of the information. I would think. Right. Uh, Sean's been saying big on the video game, actually, which kind of like I I, was, I imagine you're not big into video games, but have you kept up with that at all? Uh, did you say Sean was big in it? Yeah, yeah, Sean is the one that they pitched it to him, and Sean signed over the title. So that's how it ended up happening. Right. All those people are going to be at the uh, the Lexington Scarefest to mm-hmm. the end of September. Right. We're all going to be there together. So um, I imagine there'll be a lot of trick I've um, Actually, they've been in touch with me, too, but they're not ready for anyone of my nature they're still figuring out all the little bells and whistles right now, from what I understand. Huh. But they they did talk early. Uh, well, we did discuss some voiceovers, but we'll see what happens. Oh, that would be really cool. Would that, that be fun? Yeah, yeah that would yeah. be really cool. I They're pushing for stuff like that. I know like they're trying to get Tommy Jarvis um, into the game, which right. I, they haven't said so yet, but I'm pretty sure he's in there. I think they snuck yeah, him in. I'm but sure. Who wouldn't want to be part of something that much fun? Yeah. Uh, Kane loves it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Have you spoken to Kane lately? I haven't. Well, I haven't talked to Kane in a few months, but a, a Kane just had a tweet the other day. They just released a video um, of the Part 7 Jason walking down the boat ramp, and Kane was ecstatic about it. Says he's so happy to be back at Crystal Lake. So, oh, yay. I'm glad to hear. Yeah. Glad to hear. Always nice to keep the family together. <laughs> yeah. That's what they. Why not? Let's have like a, just one big reunion movie, okay? We'll throw Kane in at like Jason. Yeah. Throw you in at like well, the lead. Throw Amy Steele well, you, in there. <laughs> uh, originally in that '09, they asked Bestie and I to come back for just a little bit in the beginning, and we were so excited. We were all, you know totally on board. And then within a week, they changed their mind and they said to our manager that. Uh, they didn't want anyone from the original. I thought, oh, man, the fans would have loved that. And I had also thought you could have had everyone, like all the old Jasons, sitting in the original diner scene, you know, and everybody <laughs> just sitting there. And the fans would know each That's and every person, you know, as a customer or, a, you know, say they were the sheriffs or something, just sitting there eating. Nobody would even have to say a word, and the fans would just totally love that. But right. they didn't go for it. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. They did this kind of stuff for Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. for that remake. They threw, like, Gunnar Hansen into another side role. Right. Like, I don't know. Why not do that? What's the big deal? Seriously, and the fans would just just eat that stuff up. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind it, of stuff it, that I notice. <laughs> exactly. And, unfortunately, the studios don't take time to think about the fans. They're just thinking about that bottom dollar and the fastest way to get there. Yep, very true, very true. Yeah, oh well, what you gonna do, right? <laughs> um. Okay, I, I want to bring up Crystal Lake Wine a little bit. Um, okay. Especially because, I mean, that's, that's your main gig right now. Um, it is, I'm yeah. having a awesome time at the, uh, good time at the winery. <laughs> right, how did that happen? Like, how did you end up making a wine deal? It was one of those... Uh, incredible things that never happens to anyone that came from the heavens, honestly. Uh, we moved up here again 11 years ago uh, to wine country in southern Oregon. And uh, where I live, you're, we're talking my home phone because we actually have no cells here. That's we're off, not off the grid, but no cells. 
Mm. And uh, it's a very uh, beautiful winery area. And we went to the 13 of them at the time that were here. Now there's more than double that amount because uh, uh, people are finding out about the valley here. And uh, my favorite was Valley View Winery. Consistently, they had the best wines. They're family-owned and run, which is unusual uh, since uh, they were the first ones that actually started planting the vines again after the Prohibition totally pulled every vine out of Oregon um, and elsewhere, I'm sure, but I know about here they did. And uh, so the family moved from the East Coast. Uh, their dad was an engineer. He planted with the kids when they were very young and 27 acres later and how many years later since 1972? You can figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They they truly have the best wines consistently, and their winemaker John Guerrero, who is a UC Davis guy, which is a great wine. That 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 when they asked me to join their winery once when I was tasting our wine pickups, which is like every three months you go there and you see what the new wines are and pairings, food pairings. And the youngest brother, now in his forties, said, "Would you like to join our family?" And I went, "Huh." Seriously, but I, instead of actually saying, huh, <laughs> I went, I went, yeah, <laughs> I'll figure it out later, right? <laughs> and, yeah. um, and my husband was standing right next to me, so I knew he wasn't hitting on me or anything. <laughs> and I said, uh, sure, what does that mean? And he said, well, we know you love fine wine, and we love your movies. And I went, oh, my gosh, you're horror fans, too? You got the best fun. <laughs> What's your horror fans? Could it be any better than this? <laughs> and, they, and of course, they were Uber Friday fans. So, um, so I began running their tasting room and working with the winemaker. And for a solid year, I did that and learned everything I didn't know about wines. And uh, as that year was progressing, they kind of sort of came up with the idea of, do you think Chris Lake Wines you know, with fun. Do you think there'd be people out there who'd be interested in, you know, car fans that would love their own genre of wine? And I said, one way to find out, we threw it up on Facebook, Chris Lake Wines by Adrian King. The page is still there. And it blew out their website. So we knew we were on to something, and that was almost seven years ago. And we've been going strong with a new varietal every year, uh, with which uh, is my the labels are my own paintings, and I get to choose the wines that I love the best. That I think I'm pretty in touch with all my happy campers, and I kind of know what they want, and I mm-hmm. listen to them, and I take their feedback. So if they want a bigger, bolder red, okay, we've got a new cabin, cabin A Sauvignon for you, and it's just mm-hmm. been this gift that keeps on giving Friday the Thirteenth. You know, it's it's just a phenomenal thing because of the movie. I now have Crystal Lake Wines as a brand I've been building, and it sells itself because of word of mouth. It's so fabulous. And now, as you know, I go to the conventions, and if I can't physically sell it, I always have a raffle or something fun going on so to, you know, let everyone know that it's out there. And I tell you, I've never heard anything but fabulous reviews. So I'm a very... Uh, Thankful, grateful, happy camper. <laughs> and I am drinking right now. <laughs> I'm drinking. Seriously, you want to hear? Yeah. Hear I'll... this? Okay, that's little little baby ice cubes in my chiller white because I love my chiller white really chilled. And then I put a little bit of uh, seltzer on it, seltzer water, So it, and I put a little tiny piece of lemon in it, and it becomes a really outrageous spritzer. <laughs> and uh, then I can talk to you for a while and not get... <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. You know, you have to be careful when you're in the wine business not to get looped. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but um, it's it's just uh, just a wonderful thing, and uh, I've gotten so much feedback on the. the, the uh, we've done six weddings so far. Uh, we do Halloween parties. We do Mother's Day. You know, we do Christmas presents. It's Halloween. Uh, uh, it's huge for us. And not to mention every Friday 13th, it goes crazy. <laughs> and here's my newest thing that I'm going to share with you, because it's just just right now simmering. Um, 
we're going to do an Adrian King Presents YouTube that says it's going to be Friday night wine pairings. And no matter where I am, if it's at a convention or I'm at the winery, um, we're going to set up like three, uh, three bottles of wines and three uh, foods that will pair well with them. And either say George Romero wants to do what he told me and Amy feels that she wants to do it. So uh, I can't imagine um, anyone really turning me down with some <laughs> good wine and, 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 you know, and some good food. And then we just talk about whatever comes to mind, which I love, you know, as you can tell, I love to talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes I actually listen. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, do you think it's a good idea? Because everyone I've mentioned, to, uh, it was my, na- uh, my uh, nephew's wedding last week, and everyone was saying, why don't you have a YouTube channel? And so we were coming up with these ideas over the four, four-day four wedding. So uh, that's what I came home with. So what do you think? I think it's an awesome idea. Yeah. I mean, especially if you can yeah. open it up with, like, George Romero, there would be no better way to kick it off. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm figuring I should always kick it off in Lexington because it'll be the whole Friday crew almost there. That's and, true. <laughs> and Harry Manfredini has actually um, had my wine and then reordered it. And I'll share a little story about Survivor Syrah with you. He, um, I think that was the first one I gave him. And so instead of opening it and keeping it himself, he said he figured he'd bring it to it a wine party where everyone bring, brings a bottle of wine in a paper bag. Have you ever been to those? I so Well, I can't say that I've been to one, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's a blind wine tasting, which is always fun because you never know. Because, uh, you know, and that's another thing I want to do on my show is take demystify uh, fears about trying wine because there's points involved in all that nonsense. I don't buy into it. Sure, you can do points, and they help a lot, but I'm a firm believer in personal taste buds rule, and <laughs> it's what you like, <laughs> and don't listen to somebody else if you like what you like. And so he took the bottle of Survivors to Raw to this party, and there were so many other, say, well-known brands there, and Survivors to Raw came in two out of 29. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And <laughs> isn't that wonderful? And the price... Our prices in Oregon, what's so wonderful about it is Sunset Magazine actually outed us as the new Napa Sonoma at half the price because we have no state sales, state sales tax, states at three times fast. No state sales tax in Oregon, plus our overhead is so much lower being having no middleman that we actually sell, uh, my wine is 25 a bottle, including shipping with a three-bottle minimum, is equivalent to a 50 or 60 dollar bottle of wine and that's what Harry said they were up against and it was holding on so I, I was very proud to hear that particular story oh yeah that, that is amazing I was I remember asking you in Chicago like what your prices were and I was expecting some relatively high number when you said it was only 25 a bottle with free shipping I was like oh wow that is not bad at all <laughs> no and um, we may have to up it to four four bottle minimum because it's the UPS who keeps rising their prices high. You yeah, know, it's right. crazy. We keep on. If you came to the winery, you could buy the bottles of wine for twenty bucks a pop. Wow, seriously. So we'll uh, drive to Oregon and then we'll go well, get them ourselves. Have, <laughs> you know, all my shipments because I handle each and every shipment of my wine because I'm so OCD because I know if something's wrong when one of my campers opens that bottle or that you know that box and it's not perfect or what they wanted written wasn't perfect i know that i i know how upset they will be and so i never want anyone to be upset i really don't i want everyone to be a happy camper when they open their wine so every everything's through me my hands i wrap every single bottle in in tissue after i find it and uh yeah it's it's just become this incredible passion. I have three passions now. Who knew? Uh, I was going to have wine as a third passion, but between my acting and my art, I've come full circle and been able to put my paintings, my own artwork with my own character in a movie on my own branded bottle of wine. Does it get any better than that? Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy, especially yeah. after all those years for all it to come back together like that. 
and I mean that explains why it blew up so quickly as well. So yeah, yeah, it's it's going it's going like a wildfire. I yeah. wish I hate to say, it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's it's and you know it's it's obviously excellent word of mouth from everyone out there because I have reordered people who started ordering three, three or four bottles at a time are now ordering by cases because they get ten percent discount on the case and they know they love it. So that's what we do. Right. So. No, you know, it's 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 wonderful. It's, that's all I can say about it. Who would have thunk? That's what I say about Friday the Thirteenth. That's what I say about Crystal Lake wine. You could knock me over with a feather. I <laughs> still don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, you've had everything just go perfect for you. Honestly, it's just and and you know what? That's what I say to anyone out there who's going through garbage right now in their lives, or honestly holding on and thinking life really sucks. I've been there. I know how it is. <laughs> I know how it is on, on uh, a couple of times over, and I can tell you, just hang on until the next day. And I say that because I've spoken to some people who are having a rough time, and maybe a word or two from a survivor that they uh, they know and feel like we've known each other for a long time. Because most of the people out there have had me in their lives or their living rooms for over thirty years or so. So uh, trust me, hang in there. Things do get better, and uh, I am living proof of that. There is a, a there's something at the end of that rainbow that's pretty. It may not be a pot of gold, but it's pretty. <laughs> um, do you mind if I ask? You said you have a love for acting and a love for art. Um, do you have one that stands out more than the other? You know what's really interesting is that one feeds the other, and one is there for the other. So if I'm acting. My art goes on a back burner because acting is something that takes more than just me. It, it takes a, a partner. It takes it takes a crew. It takes you know it takes a village. <laughs> Whereas my art is just me alone, so I have that anytime I need it. So when I'm not acting, uh, which you know was a long time, I was doing looping and voiceovers uh, while uh, I was getting my act together mentally. <laughs> For whatever else may come after, you know, the stalker. And then I had a plane crash in 1990 on the ground. I was uh, the first one on the Avianca uh, site in 1990 on Long Island. It was crashed 500 yards from my house. So uh, we went through that. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot for your head to get back together after going through some of this stuff. And my art was always there. It was my therapy. And acting is a therapy, too, but you don't always get to do it when you need to. So that's when my painting was always there for me. I always could run through my my brushes and my paints and and just dwell there and and just like I said, it was very thera- therapeutic. But now that I have the wine, I have no time to paint. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to start. I have to somehow find the balance because I miss painting. So it's. Uh, um, I'll be do- I have a new studio to encourage me. My husband actually built me one of those little, he didn't do it himself. He had one of those little tiny houses um, built closer to the property, uh, to this main house. And it, it's empty right now. So I've got to get it sheetrocked and electricity in it and all that stuff. And uh, then I'll have my little studio like 50 yards from the house. So there's no excuse not to paint. Right. Um you know. Uh, I'll ask you uh, just one more question. It's the same question we ask anybody that comes on the show. If you could pick one movie, any movie in history, doesn't matter what genre, um, to star in, or if you're interested in directing it anyway, you could direct it anyway, just to be in any movie in history, what would it be? I'm thinking thinking it would have to be The Wizard of Oz. Oh. Or or American in Paris, and I would have... uh, Gene Kelly's role. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> I can see it. I, I can definitely see it in Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I, I love to dance. I love to sing in the shower. Uh, and I love scary elements. So that's where the Wizard of Oz would come in because you have a lot of fun and fantasy and then scary stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Gene Kelly is just because I love Paris and... I love dancing, and I love romance, you know, and I believe you can have a happy ending. That's why I love them both, I guess. Yeah. 
Wow. That's a good answer. That is a good <laughs> answer. Um, well, on, on that note, we, we've taken up quite a bit of your time. We'll, we'll go ahead and, and uh, let you go. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and I'm sure My the fans pleasure. will think so as well. <laughs> My pleasure. I thank you guys, and I'm wishing you guys a happy Friday. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much you too <laughs> you take care you too you do. once again big thanks to adrian king for joining us on this episode of slash cast if you enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and subscribe to this channel for more videos like this one as always thank you for watching and we'll see you next time